the prison doctors received permission to remove his body and bury him from the compact and unbearable heat box made of bamboo in which he was tortured for more than nine weeks in the summer of 1944. The purpose of the heat box was to, quote, sweat the truth, end quote, out of him. He had to squat in an unnatural way almost the entire time he was in the hot and humid solitary confinement to the point where his lower body was covered in sores from sitting on bamboo. When it was light enough outside, he maintained his sanity by reading two key books. One was the Bible. He read it five times. The other was Fyodor Dostoevsky's House of the Dead, a novel based on the 19th century Russian author's own experiences in a Siberian prison camp. As an army chaplain, he knew the Bible well, but it was the Russian novel that offered him a particular sense of comfort. When the doctors opened the heat box, they realized he was not dead and still breathing, faintly. He got moved to the prison hospital in secret, and it turned out that he was in a coma from dysentery. Dozens of other prisoners for whom he prayed when they were sick now prayed for him. By late September of that year, he recovered. Some thought... It was a miracle. So how did he get here in the first place? Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I have a fascinating, an unbelievable really story of survival of an American POW prisoner of war in the Asia Pacific theater during World War II. If this seems like a bit of a departure from what my subject matter has been here thus far, Russia focused, it is, but there is a Russian connection beyond Dostoevsky. The man's name is Robert Preston Taylor. And surprisingly, considering how insane this story is, there is only really one biography that was originally published in the 1970s. References to him in other history books, a couple of articles online, interviews online, and a very brief wiki bio. So I thought it would be worth looking into him in more detail. Before we do this, I really do appreciate when you guys subscribe, share, hit the notification button, and whatever else needs to be done on this platform these days because it does help me out. Thank you. So let's look at the incredible survival story of Chaplain Robert Preston Taylor. Chaplain Taylor was tall, slender, and redheaded. He was born in Henderson, Texas in 1909, not too far from the border of Louisiana. He was one of 12 children. His large family of farmers sometimes struggled to the point that in his teens, he actually pursued fur trapping to be able to put himself through school. So perhaps because of his humble upbringing, he was soft-spoken, very down-to-earth, and had an East Texan accent. Mm. One of his assistants during World War II described him, quote, as common as an old shoe, end quote. At the same time, Taylor was extremely well-educated. First, he had a Bachelor of Arts from Baylor University. Then he went on to obtain a master's and a PhD in theology from the Southwestern Baptist Seminary in 1936 and 39, respectively. In September 1940, Chaplain Taylor entered military service. World War II had already been raging for a year in Europe, which officially started with Nazi Germany's attack 
against Poland in 1939. And at the same time, the Second Sino-Japanese War had been going on in the Asia Pacific theater since 1937, and it eventually merged into World War II. So the global situation, needless to say, was very unstable and very tense, and in fact, worsening. So at this time, the U.S. supported its would-be European allies through cash and carry and eventually a lend lease. The U.S. government also placed uh, an oil embargo on Japan, which was very harmful to Japan. And the U.S. and Japan had very, very strong disagreements regarding China. Of course, Japan had invaded China in 1931 and then there was a subsequent invasion in 1937. But the U.S. would not enter World War II until December 1941, as we know. So by May of that year, Chaplain Taylor became the only chaplain for the 31st Infantry Regiment of the Philippine Division stationed in Manila, the Philippines. For historical context, at this time, the Philippines were a formal American colony acquired from Spain uh, after the Spanish-American War of 1898. And of course, that war was a very crucial turning point for formal American imperialism. Mm, so we know that the U.S. colonized Guam and Puerto Rico, and it also technically got Cuba. Cuba was formally independent, but it was subjected to repeated U.S. interventions through the Platt Amendment. So, in terms of the Philippines, the bloody and devastating war between the Filipinos and the new colonial um, power, the U.S., officially ended in 1902, but the insurgency raged on until 1913. So some historians actually point out that this war was the second longest war in American history after Afghanistan, if you look at it in this way. So at best, the Americans viewed the Filipinos at this time as children who were unable to govern themselves. At worst, you, you can imagine the types of racial epithets that they used. So that was kind of the context of what was happening in the first half of the 20th century in the Philippines. And the Philippines, of course, gained formal independence from the U.S. in 1946, but the U.S. remained a very dominant power in the region with, for instance, military bases in the Philippines. So let's go back to 1941. On December 7th, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and typically that is the way this event is remembered. However, the Japanese Imperial forces also attacked Wake and Midway Islands, Guam, as well as the Philippines. In fact, Japan ended up occupying the Philippines between 1942 and mid-1945. So the Philippines kind of took the, the brunt of this in, in some ways. The next day after Pearl Harbor, the U.S. officially declared war against Japan, and three days later, Germany and then the U.S. declared war against each other. So now the U.S. was officially involved in two, at least two, war theaters in the Asia-Pacific, and in Europe and, of course, North Africa as well. So Taylor and the 31st Infantry Division were transferred to the Bataan Peninsula. Chaplain Taylor performed very valiantly, and he received a silver star for gallantry during the Battle of Bataan in early 1942. At this time, Taylor was attached to Battlefield Hospital No. 2. However, the battle was lost for the Americans due to the overarching circumstances. First and most important, President Franklin Roosevelt chose to prioritize the European war theater and the allies in Europe, and as a result, General Douglas MacArthur, who oversaw the Philippines and had 
actually strong attachment to the islands had to reluctantly withdraw. So on April 9th, 1942, the American side through General Edward King surrendered for the purpose of saving lives to the Japanese Imperial Army that at the time was led by General Masaharu Homma. The American troops actually held out a lot longer than the Japanese mm, expected them to, and they were in pretty poor shape. They're shell-shocked, they're suffering from various illnesses like malaria, they were malnourished, running out of supplies to the point where they're getting creative and mm, eating whatever came their way, such as monkeys. In fact, the Japanese did the same thing. So this particular surrender was enormous. The combined U.S. and Filipino troops were estimated to be at up to 78,000 people. On top of that, they were uh, approximately 20,000 Filipino civilians that were caught in the middle of this. So the Japanese imperial forces were victorious, but they're completely unprepared for this number of people. They underestimated them by at least 60,000. And the other important aspect of this is that they did not account for the poor health of the surrendering troops but they made absolutely no changes to their logistical plans of marching on foot from where the surrender took place in the Bataan Peninsula to Camp O'Donnell. The overall distance was 75 miles, which is 120 kilometers, most of which was to be marched on foot, with the exception of a brief train ride. So what ensued was a humanitarian disaster that came to be known as the Bataan Death March. Mm, many historians attribute this event to incompetence and in individual cases of brutality by the Japanese imperial forces, as opposed to it being more of a pre-planned uh, awful event. So those prisoners of war who were unable to keep up had a lower chance of survival. Uh, seven, several thousand Filipinos and an estimated 750 American soldiers, some estimates are higher, died along the way for various reasons. Exhaustion, malnutrition, the elements, or they're simply killed. When they were killed, uh, sometimes this happened because the Japanese imperial forces punished them for being slow walkers. And of course, they walked slow for health reasons. So sometimes they would disembowel them with their, uh, with their swords. So it appears that General Homma was unaware that this atrocity was actually unfolding in Bataan because A... Uh, it was well known that he was uninterested in minutia. He delegated smaller tasks to, to others. And it's also clear that he did not give a direct order for this to take place. Nonetheless, Homma was executed by firing squad in 1946 after a war crimes trial that was held exclusively by the Americans outside of the framework of the Tokyo Tribunal system that was taking place at the same time. So for these reasons, Homma's execution remains controversial according to some historians. Eventually, those who survived the death march uh, ended up at Camp O'Donnell. The camp was meant for a much smaller group of people. So historians like Hampton Sides described it as, quote, a putrid place, end quote, in which prisoners who did not die from malaria or dysentery were, quote, beaten to death, shot, beheaded, bayoneted, end quote. So as a result, at least 10% of the prisoners died in this way in this location. Chaplain Taylor describes the Bataan death march as follows, quote, we had hundreds of men in the hospitals there who were crippled and wounded. The Japanese ordered them all who could walk, walk to get on the death march. 
they may have picked up a few who became exhausted and fell on the death march, but the most of them were bayoneted or shot. The Japanese didn't make any effort to organize or to evacuate us out of there by trucks. I think they could have done that. All these trucks which had been used to bring in recruitments, reinforcements, or equipment, and manpower, and everything else, could have been concentrated on evacuating these prisoners of war. But they didn't do that. Their main thrust was to get these prisoners of war out of the way, if they could, so they could go on to Corregidor. So they ordered them to march, the crippled, one-legged, peg-legged, sick, wounded. So the death march took only God knows how many lives, end quote. On the one hand, when General King officially surrendered, he actually offered American vehicles to transport the POWs to the Japanese for whatever reason, the Japanese Imperial forces refused to do this. And it's also important to note, on the other hand, that the Japanese continued to experience oil scarcity, so they preferred to march to use horses in contrast to the oil-abundant Americans, so perhaps this informed their thinking. Taylor personally witnessed the beginning stages of the death march prior to the main atrocities, and that is because he was separated from the main group and he was taken to Battlefield Hospital Number 1. After that, the Japanese uh, imprisoned Chaplain Taylor, along with others, in an old colonial Spanish prison uh, called the Bilibit prison, prison for a number of weeks. Uh, Taylor referred to the structure as, quote, gloomy, dismal, end quote, and a, quote, horrible setup, end quote. So his time in the prison was, quote, a typical poverty-type prison experience, end quote. Finally, he and the others were marched through the streets of Manila, uh, and they rode a train. He commented, quote, they herded us into these boxcars just like cattle, end quote, and they marched a part of the way to the Cabana Tuan prisoner of war camp to join the others from the death march. The unbearable conditions and the consequent high death toll at um, the, the first camp, O'Donnell, is the reason why the Japanese transferred the primarily American, but also some allied prisoners of war to Cabana Chuan. Back in Texas, um, Taylor's wife received a notification that he was unaccounted for. She read that to mean that he was killed in action and eventually she ended up marrying another man. The Cabana Chuan compound was larger than Camp O'Donnell, but the prisoners themselves had to create basically uh, absolute basic living arrangements. So that meant digging septic systems, irrigation, boiling clothes to kill parasites, using chemicals to maintain their latrines. They played sports. They named streets after streets back home. They established a cafe, a library that was comprised of books from the Red Cross. Socializing was important, as was religion, and keeping time every half an, half an hour was also very important for them to maintain their sanity because, of course, a, death was all around, and B, they had no idea how long they would be in the status of prisoners of war. Still, they experienced chronic malnutrition, which negatively impacted their hair, their teeth, their eyesight, they lost weight, and they were also more susceptible to more serious illnesses. So some prisoners' weight dropped from that of a typical adult male below 90 pounds. Uh, in fact, Chaplain Taylor's dropped from his normal 170 pounds 
to somewhere in the 85 pound range. So he lost half of his body weight because they're so focused on the lack of food. They actually dreamt more and fantasized more about food than women. And they also ba lacked basic medication for something like malaria. So the situation remained dire for the POWs. At Cabana Tuan, Chaplain Taylor was one of the key chaplains responsible for the spiritual needs of the thousands of prisoners of war. And in fact, he worked in what could arguably be described as the most miserable part of the hospital, of the camp in uh, the hospital known as Zero Ward. And the reason it was called that is the fact that those who ended up in Zero Ward were not expected to make it. So since death was all around, providing spiritual guidance was very important. After all, there is a famous army saying attributed to Chaplain William Thomas Cummings and others. And the saying is, quote, there are no atheists in foxholes, end quote. So Chaplain Taylor focused on burials, funeral rites for at least hundreds of prisoners. And one of his fellow prisoners at Cabana Tuan uh, recalled that, quote, everyone knew him and respected him. Wherever people were most in need, that's where you'd find him, end quote. And it was Taylor's willingness to help others that landed him in the torture heat box that we discussed at the beginning in the summer of 1944. He was one of the central participants in a secret underground network smuggling medicines, food, and other types of supplies into the prisoner of war camp. His code name was very simple, Chap Bob. The leader of this underground network was a woman known as High Pockets, and she was also known by several other um, false identities. She was a nightclub owner in Manila. Her real name was Claire Phillips. She was a civilian who became an American spy in World War II. So needless to say, her own story, which is beyond the scope of this video, is, of course, really, really interesting. So the only thing that Chaplain Taylor requested from High Pockets when asked was a New Testament in the Greek language because he wanted to, to maintain his languages while imprisoned. When the Japanese Imperial forces uh, inter intercepted this package, they saw that uh, the, the book was signed with the name Chap Bob. They quickly identified that it referred to Taylor and they ended up rounding up um, several people on the inside of, of the camap. And many of them were ch chaplains and all of them were tortured. So for example, one chaplain was beaten so badly that they broke his neck. And Taylor, in turn, received the longest punishment in the, the heat box made of bamboo that he barely survived. When Taylor recovered from his ordeal in September 1944, he was placed on the list of 1,600 uh, healthiest POWs to be taken to Japan for prisoner labor, or if you'd like to call it slave labor. So by this time, the prisoners could hear and see an increase of American air activity over their heads, so they thought that the American return to the Philippines was just around the corner. And they were right, because the invasion of Leyte began in October 1944, and on the 20th of that month, General MacArthur famously exclaimed, quote, I have returned, end quote, after he disembarked on the islands. So some prisoners used 
any means available to them to avoid being taken to Japan where they thought that their chances of survival would be a lot lower to the point where they would use hot stools, stool samples infected with dysentery from other prisoners to avoid being taken on the ship going to Japan. So Chaplain Taylor remembered this time as follows, quote, We all suspected that the possibilities of successfully making the sea voyage were remote, end quote. Taylor, along with others, was taken to the Bilibid prison once again, where everyone spent approximately two months. On December 13th, the POWs were transferred aboard Oryoku Mario. This was a luxury liner from the 1930s. However, it was the Japanese civilians, the occupation forces, that were fleeing the Philippines, and they are the ones that got the first and second class compartments. The 1600 POWs were taken into the cargo area below the ship, which was obviously neither meant for humans nor humans in that uh, great amount, quantity. So the uh, mm, by then, the American airplanes had already, quote, turned the harbor into a marine graveyard, end quote, according to historian Hampton Sides. So Chaplain Taylor pointed out that, quote, the men milled around restlessly on the dock as though it was the night before an execution, end quote. The cargo area below the ship was not only poorly ventilated, but it could only fit all the prisoners like the proverbial sardines in a can. So due to the lack of oxygen and the rising temperatures where everyone sat skin to skin, some men began to faint. Chaplain Taylor remembered, quote, The heat was indescribable, unbearable. We perspired profusely and became gripped by a gnawing thirst, end quote. As a result, some POWs panicked, but what the Japanese forces did, they made things even worse because they closed the hatch at at the top. So now the whole um, bottom part of the ship, the cargo area, was in the dark as the ship was departing from the Manila Harbor. According to historian Hampton Sides, quote, All through the night, the ship motored slowly around the Bataan Peninsula. In the pitch black, the men became crazy with fear. They shrieked gibberish. They cried and clawed at each other in claustrophobic hysteria. Some were so crazed with thirst that they drank their own urine. Others turned into human vampires, biting their fellows in the dark and sucking their blood." End quote. By morning, 50 POWs were dead. According to Chaplain Taylor, quote, It was a nightmare of darkness and suffocation. We had suffered the torments of perdition, the worst night of our lives, end quote. But things only got worse after that point. The next day, the American bombers either chased away or destroyed every escorting vessel of the Oryoku Maru. By 5 p.m., the American bomb crippled the ship. In this attack, hundreds of Japanese, including women and children, were killed or hurt. The Japanese actually relied on the American POW doctors to get some aid for those who were wounded. The Japanese towed the ship at night into Subic Bay. Chaplain Taylor recalled being trapped at the bottom of the ship as it was being repeatedly struck by his fellow Americans. Quote, Well, it's hard to describe those moments unless you were actually there. But I'll tell you, my first impression was that the American prisoners of war were soldiers to the very end. 
I can remember hearing them say now, as the guns were strafing the decks of that ship, you'd hear these GIs say, quote, give them heck, Joe, end quote. Here, we were right down under it. It was a tremendous experience. A lot of our men, of course, were in bad shape by this time. Of course, there was sickness, but I guess there were hundreds of Japanese killed by those strafings above. But the thought was, well, after you've gone through as much as you have, I think the good Lord kind of prepares us to accept whatever comes. We were prepared for anything. We were prepared for a bomb to explode the ship and destroy us all. There was no panic. The men acted with as much natural attitude or natural reaction, I think, in those moments as I had ever seen anybody act." End quote. So the American bombers returned the next morning, December 15th, at 8 o'clock in the morning. And they began striking the ship repeatedly. So the ship, of course, was not marked as a ship carrying POWs, which made matters worse. And um, Taylor's estimate of the POW death toll was approximately 650, but historians suggest that 1,300 POWs survived the entire ordeal in, in, this, in this particular situation with Oriokumaru, which would bring the POW death toll closer to um, 300. So at this time, Chaplain Taylor was with a group of 10 men, and they were hit by an explosion on the stern of the ship, which set the hull on fire. Quote, After the impact of that explosion, a hail of falling debris and planks rained down on us. Then there was a moment of complete silence, not a scream or a moan when everything seemed to be over. End quote. Taylor's hip and wrist were hit with shrapnel, and he was one of the only two survival survivors from this group of 10 men. However, later Chaplain Taylor did not receive a Purple Heart because his injuries came from his own forces. The captain of Oriokumaru, Captain Wada, allowed the remaining POWs to swim ashore. The Japanese used the lifeboats for themselves. So the chaplain and the POWs started to swim. He tried to ignore um, how painful salt water was on his wounds, and he estimated the swim distance to have been about 300 yards or 274 meters. However, since many of the POWs like him were injured, mm, swimming was difficult, so they held on to the debris from the ship. Chaplain Taylor recalled, quote, I guess several hundred got into the water and were swimming ashore. The American bombers came back. There were three of them, dive bombers. They saw all of this group coming out, and one of them dropped down and circled low around the ship and saw that we were Americans. They dipped their wings in salute and went back and joined the other two. And they went away and stayed away for about two or three hours." End quote. Meanwhile, on the shore, Japanese guards started shooting with their machine guns at the POWs that they thought were straying a little too far away from the main swim group. So once all the POWs reached the shore, they gathered at a tennis court that was there. And eventually the American bombers returned, ensuring the POWs were, uh, had vacated the ship and they destroyed Oriokumaru. Taylor recalled, quote, the planes barrel down one right after the other and dropped a string of bombs from bow to stern. That old ship went up in flames in just a few minutes. It didn't take long to sink, end quote. It is for this reason that the Oriokumaru and other ships like it came to be known as hell ships. The POWs were forced to stay at this tennis court for six days under very hot sun, which 
caused them severe burns because they're not exactly dressed. Mm, they lack medical supplies, so doctors basically had to use whatever was available to them. So sometimes they would rely on razors to treat the, the wounds of the injured. Mm, at this time, dozens of POWs died and Chaplain Taylor once again was in charge of carrying out burials and funeral rites. Then the Japanese Imperial forces took 15 of the most injured American POWs. They drove them into the jungle and they beheaded them one by one. The remaining estimated 1300 POWs were taken uh, by train to an old uh, school in the Lingayen Gulf area on December 20th. Eight days later, the POWs were placed onto an old ship called Enora Maru, along with hundreds of wounded Japanese soldiers. And they traveled for around four days to Formosa, Japanese-occupied Taiwan. Every day, four to five POWs died. The conditions were terrible. According to Taylor, quote, that old ship, the old scow we called it, had been used as a ship to transport horses from Japan to the Philippines. It hadn't been cleaned in 10 years. It was full of lice. We were a, quote, lousy, end quote, group by the time we got to Formosa, end quote. The ship also had to evade American submarines as it traveled, so the journey was equally dangerous. Mm, the POWs were initially only fed a small, small portion of rice, and it was covered with black, black flies, and eventually the Japanese stopped feeding them altogether. On New Year's Day of 1945, the old ship arrived in uh, Takao Harbor, the southwest coast of Taiwan. Today it's known as Tsoin Harbor. The POWs were forced to stay on board of the ship for another eight days while the Japanese soldiers were able to disembark upon arrival. On January 9th, the American dive bombers struck Enora Maru and 295 POWs were killed in this attack. So of the total 1,600 American POWs who departed the Philippines, approximately 700 were now dead. Those who died in this strike had their limbs ripped off their bodies and their bodies pulled apart. Chaplain Taylor recalled his experiences on both ships as follows. Quote, well, it's a pretty terrifying experience to go through because you first feel the impact of your explosion and then there's the falling of the debris and the flying of planks and everything from the decks. Then there's the quiet moment when seemingly everything is over. Complete silence. You don't hear a scream. You don't hear a moan. You don't hear anything for just a moment. Then we began to get to our feet, you know. When something like that happens, you fall flat on your stomach and get as close to whatever you're standing or lying on as possible. End quote. Yet, after these significant strikes by U.S. bombers, Enora Maru did not sink. But the survivors were kept on it for another three days. Finally, Chaplain Taylor and the other remaining POWs were taken aboard yet another ship. So this is now ship number three, Brazil Maru, on January 13th. Quote, well, from Formosa to Japan was a very trying trip of suffering. Again, we didn't have adequate food, we didn't have adequate water, we certainly had no heat, the men had no clothing." End quote. Arriving in Moji, Japan, the Red Cross met the POWs and some were taken to the hospital. Chaplain Taylor had a chest injury 
from the second ship on top of his initial wrist and hip injuries from the first ship. ship. And he estimated that at least 200 POWs died from exposure and their wounds. From there, the chaplain and other Americans ended up in a prison camp for Australian POWs in the Japanese city of Fukuoka, known as the Fukuoka Prison Camp Number 22. He described the conditions there as, quote, it was a very nice camp. It was very comfortable compared to what we had, end quote. However, the Australian POWs, prison labor or slave labor, if you'd like, was used in the coal mines while the Americans recovered in the hospital and simply by not working. Then in late April, the American prisoners of war were transferred to the Japanese occupied Manchuria in Mukden, which is the Chinese city of Shenyang, by the way of Busan, Korea, which was also Japanese occupied at this time. So for historical context, between the early 20th century and until 1945, Japan was a prominent empire in its Asia Pacific region. Between 1910 and 1945, Japan colonized and controlled Korea. Then in 1931, Imperial Japan invaded China's Manchuria and was in an all-out war with China by 1937, including such atrocities as the Nanjing Massacre. So at the height of its expansion, Japan also controlled parts of, or fully, the Philippines, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Burma, or Myanmar, and Thailand. The Japanese Empire had kind of a euphemistic name. It was known as the Greater Asian Coal Prosperity Sphere, but of course, Japan used these foreign lands to help itself with its growing population and limited resources on the islands. Mm. Chaplain Taylor described his captors during his journey uh, to Manchuria as follows, quote, These guards were not in the wartime situation, and their superiors were not pressing upon them to treat the prisoners badly, but rather to treat them fairly. So we had good care, end quote. So it seems that um, Taylor believed that the Japanese treated the Allied POWs in a particularly atrocious way when they were under extreme war stress and they also had uh, supply problems and issues of that nature, for instance, in the Philippines. So when they were back home, even under American bombs, they seemed to treat the POWs in a relatively more humane manner. Of course, it may be that Taylor's perception of what is good and comfortable was skewed at the time because of his awful experience in the death march and the camp in the Philippines. So be that as it may, this is a pretty fascinating aspect of human nature pushed to the limit. And for Taylor, it's quite obvious that his faith is one of the things that kept him going. Quote, there is always the message, this spiritual ministry, that a minister can perform under the most trying of experiences. Number one is that we can tell our men that although the man who believes uh, he's not exempted from suffering, he's not exempted from danger, he's not exempt from sickness or disease, if he will put his trust and faith in God and the Christ that we serve, he may also find, even in the midst of suffering and in the midst of disease and in the midst of trouble, he may find an inner peace that helps him through such hours. They accept this. They're looking for something. They're groping for something and they find it. That is a true message of a Christian at such an hour." End quote. The camp to which Chaplain Taylor and other American POWs were taken in Mukden uh, was known as Rotan Camp, or at least that's the way it's referred to in an interview that I've read. But I think what they mean 
is the Hoten camp that was located in that city in Manchuria, which to me is absolutely crazy because it's this camp that is associated with the infamous Unit 731 that conducted absolutely inhuman experiments on humans during World War II, insane medical experiments. But of course, this is the end of the war, and if I'm right, it is this camp. The situation was quite a bit different. What Chaplain Taylor recalled is, quote, the prisoners who had been there all during the winter worked in the factories. We were all just skin and bone. They looked very well. They've had very good food, end quote. So at this time, it was the Red Cross that um, helped with supplying and furnishing this particular camp. The compound featured British, Australian, and Dutch POWs in addition to the American arrivals. Now, the former performed prison labor or slave labor, if you'd like, in the factories. Now, the Japanese even increased the uh, rations and fed the POWs fish and it was at this stage that Chaplain Taylor began to gain weight. And when he was weighed, he was up to 97 pounds. Remember, his normal weight was 170. So that is still quite significantly below what would be, you know, a healthy, uh, a healthy man of his age. So at first, the POWs did not know that the Soviet Union had entered the war in the Asia Pacific theater. Let's recall that the Red Army was responsible for up to 80% of Nazi German losses in the European theater of war. And when the Allies uh, reached victory in May of 1945, the very large and experienced Red Army was now free to help the war effort in the Asia Pacific theater. So the final Allied conference in Potsdam is where the Soviet Union finally committed to entering the war in August of that year. And so they did. On August 8th, 1945, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan and sent over a million troops into Manchuria. It was the Soviet participation um, that was one of the key reasons why President Truman's authorization of the first use of nuclear weapons against Hiroshima and Nagasaki, an absolutely atrocious event, was absolutely unnecessary. So, just a few weeks later, the American POWs learned that the war was over. The official surrender was signed on September 2nd, 1945. So, Chaplain Taylor recalled the liberation of the POW camp by the Soviet forces as follows, quote, well, the Russians came in and man, they brought in their interpreter. He gave a speech to us about how wonderful and how glad they were to liberate us from these Japanese warmongers and pigs and people like that. The American prisoners of war grabbed him up on the shoulders, did it in the American style. They paraded around the grounds with him. From a formality viewpoint, the Russians liberated us, but they got there after we were already free and everything, but it was all right. Then the Russians offered to do everything in the world they could for us. We were free then to go into town. The Russians took over the guarding of the town, so we went to Chinese homes as uh, at their invitation. For a number of days, we remained there under the supervision of, supervision of our command, with the protection of the Russian guards, and so forth, in the city, and out until the Russians were able to build a road to the Yellow Sea. It was the 11th of September, I believe it was, before we got out of there. We were there almost a month." End quote. So, it was the Soviet forces that facilitated Chaplain Taylor's and other POW's return home, at this stage of the journey there, after everything that Taylor had been through, he learned that his wife, 
presuming that he was dead, married someone else. And for him, this was, of course, quite devastating, especially at this stage of survival. But eventually, in 1950, he remarried. He uh, stayed in the army. He became major general. And Robert Preston Taylor passed away in 1997 after having a long life. Wow. Now you can see why I thought this story was absolutely mind-blowing, considering that Chaplain Taylor survived multiple prisoner of war camps in different countries, three hell ships, prisons, and uh, torture. I mean, it's just absolutely unbelievable. And he seemed to have been able to recover from all of it with his faith guiding the way. I, hoped I hope you guys liked this story and found it as fascinating as I have. I would love to hear your comments. I'll leave some references below and I will see you soon. Thank you for watching. Bye.